The next uh, talk will be given by Jonas Schwab. Jonas? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Jonas is here. Jonas is available for the talk and he will do an introduction about the data structure for uh, the letters. Jonas? Yes, I am. So, one second, I just have to open this. Um, so, yeah, as Florian said, uh, I'm talking about the lattice, how the, the lattice is implemented in Alf. So, uh, right now you should see the lattice and My, my presentation, I mean. And yeah, so let's start here. First, my outline. First, I will um, briefly talk about the, the components um, of a lattice and how they are implemented in ALF. So first of all, uh, the Bravais lattice and then the unit cell, basically the two components of a, of a lattice and then how to um, keep track of um, unit cell and, and primary letters because uh, in, in the, the ALF core, you basically have only one index and how to map this one index to the relationship between unit cell and primary letters. And then I will um, um, introduce the, the, uh, the predefined lattices, um, which is, um, yeah, uh, a, a subroutine which has some, as, is, as the name says, some predefined lattices to easily implement new models and don't um, rewrite any, uh, every uh, kind of lattice new. And I will just briefly show a bit uh, on, on two examples what kind of predefined lattices we have. So, yeah, first very basic, how is a, a lattice, uh, yeah. what are the contents of a lattice? Um, I will take here as an example, the honeycomb lattice it has, first of all, the Bravais lattice, which uh, finds the periodicity. Um, so in the case of the honeycomb, it's a triangular lattice with uh, the, um, the basis vectors, so A1 and A2, that span the, the lattice. So the vectors one zero and one half uh, um, with uh, a square root three over two. And the unit cell um, with, with two orbitals. So these two orbitals at zero and at, uh, at zero, zero and at zero, one over square root of two, and this is then repeated periodically with these vectors. And yeah, so the first step is how is the lattice implemented or how is the Bravais lattice implemented in our, uh, in ALF. And this is uh, through a, a Fortran type lattice. So type is a kind of, um, the, uh, uh, is a kind of derived um, uh, structure, um, like for example, in, in it's basically kind of an, an object, and this um, is defined through through vectors. So first, um, the two vectors that uh, a one and a two I already mentioned, which span the real real space, and since um, we only simulate finite lattices. Um, we also have the, uh, the vectors L1 and L2, which uh, basically define, which define the periodic boundary conditions that, uh, uh, that define how big our lattices are. And um, since this uh, L1 and L2 can only uh, can also be non-parallel to A1 and A2. We also can implement uh, some tilted lattices 
So that's basically a lattice with uh, non-trivial topology. And um, yeah, we can also simply set L2 equals A2 uh, to simulate a one-dimensional um, Bravi lattice. And yeah, this Bravi lattice object can be created by um, calling this Fortran subroutine, which yeah takes this the four vectors, uh, which are two-dimensional real uh, arrays, and then it returns this uh, lattice object. Yeah, and yeah, now to uh, see how how the the um, the k points are defined because like this basic uh, this explicitly defines how our real points look like uh, in uh, in our space in, in our letters and the k points are first of all um, bounded by the um, by the reciprocal lattice vector which are defined by this uh, ortho orthogonal relation with uh, the um, product the, um, the scalar product with the um, the vectors which span our, our real space um, and the the k space quantization is defined by if we uh, if we uh, make a scalar product with a with a k vector and one of the um, vectors that um, define our periodicity, we have to get an integer. So I call this integer k1 and k2. And basically by inverting uh, this uh, equations, we get we, we, we can derive that um, k is then a linear combina combination of these two basis vectors, which are um, themselves linear combinations of uh, the reciprocal lattice vectors. And yeah, as I said, with this, we can also uh, classify uh, tilted, tilted lattices, which is yeah, a nice feature. <laughs> and yeah, here this is the summary of the, the other contents of this uh, lattice, of this Prairie lattice type. Um, yeah, the, the first four components is the one which defined the, the unit vectors and the um, vectors L, L1 and L2. And then it, it calculates how many uh, unit cells are in, the, in our Bravi lattice. And it defines a, a list which maps from a, a, a continuous um, integer which, which loops to all n unit uh, over, over uh, all the unit cells to um, basically a linear combina combination of our um, basis uh, primitive vectors vector cells and to to basically get from from this integer uh, our location in uh, our location of the according unit cell in the uh, Bravi letters. And the same way we can uh, go uh, the other direction by this int list. And uh, we can also, uh, the NN list shows our nearest neighbors. So if we have go on site, site I and go one step um, to um, in direction of A1, then we, we just um, need to look at an end list of I10. And yeah, this is very, very handy in, in implementing the hopping. And this IMJ um, is very handy for um, correlation functions. So if we um, want to look the correlation between index I and index J, we then 
get with i and j the index for the difference between i and j which will be extensively used in in uh, measuring correlation functions um, yeah then we also have the reciprocal space vectors and the the k quantization already defined in the in the slide in the previous slide and here similar to list and inf list of for real space we have a an analogous list for uh, for k space yeah uh, on top of that um uh, the the probably lattice um the model mod, the module of the lattice module uh, has also the um, Fourier transformation uh, defined both for from R to K and from K to R, um, where you can where we can transform uh, arrays of a different ranks. Uh, the only important thing is that the the or the uh, the important thing is that the, the first index has to be the um, yeah, the the uh, lattice uh, unit cell index, which goes from over the, all the, the number of unit cells which are uh, present in the in the Brauer lattice. Yeah, yeah, and then we can easily put, uh, make a free transform. And then the the second part is the unit cell type, which is a, a much simpler type. It just takes two in integers, so the number of orbitals. So in case of a, a, a honeycomb, that is it would just be, or well, it would be two orbitals, and the coordination number in case of a honeycomb that is would be three, and then the deposition of the orbitals within one unit cell, and um, then to uh, to get from the uh, unit cell and private lattice together um, to the the whole number total number of orbitals we basically have to um, multiply the number of um, uh, of unit cells so that would be the the private lattice object and in fortran with with this percent we um, access a member of this um, uh, uh, Ravi lattice, which in this case is this n here. So let's see here, this n, the number of uh, lattice points in a Ravi lattice, and um, multiply this by the number of orbitals per unit cell. And uh, this is then in the source code usually uh, called ndim, which is then the total number of um, fermionic orbitals on our lattice. And there we also have then, uh, or the, the usual convention is to define these two arrays, list and inf list, which should not be uh, confused with the previously uh, mentioned uh, List and inf list, which are members of the uh, of the Bravi lattice, and these this define these define a mapping from the fermion superindex, which uh, yeah, uh, goes over the, all the endim possible uh, uh, orbitals in total, and map maps it to um, number. The, the unit cell number and the orbital number, and conversely, the the inverse is also defined in inflist. And here's the example how usually inflist is defined. List and inflist is defined. So allocate basically means it's um, yeah allocates memory for this uh, list, which is a which has a, a, an array of size first dimension n dim and second dimension uh, two, and then uh, inflist has the first dimension number of unit cell and the 
Second dimension is the number of orbitals per unit cell. And yeah, here then we, we loop over all unit cells and over all orbitals of each unit cell. And then NC is in this case the, the super index, which goes over all, uh, um, all fermi unit. Uh, orbitals, and then we can set here list and int list like this. So, which is usually um, done in predefined lattices, but it's still useful to know then to properly know how to use this inf and list and int list um, uh, returned by the predefined lattice. Uh, and yeah, here we can get over, already get to the predefined lattices. So, this is a module, as I mentioned or, uh, already before, really handy because it already defines a, a square lattice, honeycomb lattice, n length lat ladder, which is like a square lattice, but it has only a um, periodic boundary condition in one dimension and open boundary condition in another, in the other dimension. So it's basically a, a one dimensional system, which I will in a moment, um, get two more uh, more in detail, and then we have also defined a bilayer, a bilayer square lattice, and a bilayer honeycomb lattice. So this uh, subroutine takes um, as input uh, the lattice type, which is one of these five, and um, the 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 um, lattice sizes L1 and L2. And then it will calculate uh, for, for you the total number of orbitals um, and list, inf list, let, and let unit. So the, the Perry letters and the unit cell and yeah, this object I just defined. And here, as uh, the second to last slide, the, uh, here, how the, the honeycomb honeycomb lattice is then defined in this predefined structures, as I mentioned in the beginning. Um, so the, this is the, the A1 vector, which is uh, one zero, and the A2 vector is the um, 0.5 and square root of, a, of, uh, of three over two. So this, these zeros in the end are there uh, because of some Fortran uh, uh, peculiarity that uh, otherwise these um, these floats wouldn't be double floats but but only a single precision float and then we would throw away precision if we didn't wouldn't uh, write this d zeros everywhere here and yeah then we can just with these four vectors create the um, Bravi letters and similar here, um, we then set here the let uh, and the let unit cell gets set manually. So here the number of orbitals, as I said, this percent accesses um, a member of the of this uh, object called let unit. So it accesses the number of orbitals equals two. And, she, and uh, it sets the number, the coordination number equals to three. This backslash here is a typo, shouldn't be there. And then we uh, also allocate um, the pushes, positions of the unit cell. So the first dimension is the number of orbitals, which is two. And the second dimension is the um, yeah, dimension of our lattice. So this could also be one or three, depending on how, how many dimension our lattice should have in total. And there we set, as before, um, the coordination, the coordinates of our, um, the first orbital and the second orbital. And um, finally, the last example, is the n-leg letter, which is basically like 
a square lattice, which in the first dimension has a um, size uh, L1 and in the second dimension L2, but there is no periodic boundary uh, condition in the second dimension, only open boundary condition. So it is a, in fact um, a one-dimensional system, but with um, uh, so here is, for example, a three-leg letter um, with three uh, orbitals per unit cell. And yeah, so according to this, then we set um, A1 to uh, one zero, A2 we set to zero one, but that's actually not important which value as A2 is long. Uh, 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 L2 has the same value as A2 because we want to have a one dimensional uh, system. And then we set L1, the vector L1 times the uh, length L1 times the vector A1. Create this lattice. And then we set in the, in the unit cell the number of orbitals equals to L2. So in this case, it would be three. And um, allocate um, this array defining the locations in the, in the unit cell. First dimension is the number of orbitals. The second dimension is two, since we have a two-dimensional lattice. Uh, like in total, is two-dimensional lattice, but the uh, one dimensional um, Ravier lattice and yeah, set here the, the locations for the, the orbitals. Yeah, so, and then well, finally, here's the list of the predefined lattices defined in our, uh, yeah, in, in this predefined lattices subroutine we provide. So the first square lattice, the second is a bilayer square lattice, and then the n leg letter, uh, honeycon lattice, and the um, bilayer uh, honeycon lattice. Yeah, that's it. Um, are there any questions? on how the lattices are defined. We have five more minutes for questions before we go on with the tutorial. Uh, thank you, Jonas, for the nice talk and the introduction to the lattice data structures. Tarun Grover has a question. Yeah, I have a question. I understand the structure, but which folder should I go to to generate a new lattice? But what should be my I was slightly confused about the directory structure uh, in the Fortran. Suppose I, I, I'm not so familiar with PyAlf right now, but within just directly in the Fortran, uh, how should I do uh, it? Let's say triangle lattice or something, or something else, or Kagome lattice. Uh, uh, well, I mean, you, you don't have to do anything with the folders. I'm not sure I understand the question. So you, you, you you just oh, oh, oh. you create a new um you 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 um uh, declare a new variable of this type um lattice and type unit cell and then set them like like a i've shown or like call no, no, but yeah i was wondering which file function. should i do this which part of the this was totally confused which uh, I, I would just do it in the Hamiltonian itself. Like, okay. So okay, that was awesome. I, I I I think it will be will become a bit more clear uh, in the later parts where we will show how to write your own Hamiltonian. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank so. you. As far as I remember, it boils. Uh, it, these are all. Um, uh, a lot of this is with relation to the helper structures for the hopping matrices. Yeah. Uh, right. If I may, I think if you if you just um, at at one point we will introduce this plain vanilla Hubbard, and then things will become much more clear. I, I believe. Okay. 
Joanne, can I can I comment? Go ahead. So Tarun, exactly what, what Jonas was saying, there is a, a, an easy starting point is to go into the file prog and then backslash Hamiltonians, right? And in there you will find the Hamiltonian plain vanilla Hubbard. Can you hear me, Tarun? Uh, yes, yes, that's why I yeah. was muted. This, this is the easiest possible, you know, starting point of the, for, to, to program something with the ALP. And then in the sub, and, and basically there is a routine which is called ham set. Right. And routine will basically generate the lattice, generate the interaction, et cetera. So in the routine ham lat, that is where you will find your, uh, mm -hmm. the, the generation of the, of the lattice. I see. I think that the reason mm -hmm. I was I was asking was I would I would have thought that the because it looks very modular everything I would have thought that the Hamiltonian is separate from the lattice. Like I was thinking, can I generate a file which is which only knows about lattice and then yes. I, that was yes, my can. that's in the predefined lattices. Right. Yeah. So I, I think that was my question. Is can can I can I add to predefined lattices, my own new lattices. Of so course. I like of course. that was a bit. Yes, of course. Yes, then, then, then this is then here, like uh, in the uh, ALF, then there's the right, rock, right, right, and right, then right. there's here this predefined okay. lattices. I see. So I can just go there and, and add things myself. Yes. Okay, okay. I think that was my basically question. Okay, thank yeah. you. If Great. I may add a comment, uh, you can, and you are absolutely free to do this. However, I think in general, these, uh, the idea was uh, to, to work with the Hamiltonian as long as you can uh, and not change uh, the, the core routines because there you might have to keep more structure around uh, in mind to do so. So for example, in this predefined lattice, um, they will can then later on be uh, used uh, uh, um, like the, the bipartitioning or the checkerboard decomposition of hopping matrices and so on. I think there's more structure to it, isn't there, Fakir? No, I, actually there I, I must disagree, Johannes. I mean, for example, it would be great if Tahun, for example, would define a Kagome lattice, right? Mm -hmm. This is not defined yet. And then if he puts it in predefined lattices and does it correctly, we, then we could push it in the master branch and everybody of us could use the Kagome of, of Taun, right? That's, sure. That is the idea. So it, it, I think it is a good right. thing to do it, but there you have to, everything which is predefined should be modular enough so that other people can use it and should be documented, that's all. <laughs> right, 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 right. That's right. the issue, right? The documentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But okay. in principle, that's the way, I think that's the way to do it because then we can, build the sort of library of lattices. Right, right. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? I don't see anybody has unmuted himself and I don't see anything in the chat. Let's check, no. So let's thank Jonas again. And I will hand over to Jefferson who is uh, starting with uh, the tutorial exercises. Let me remind you again, we have helpers and breakout rooms available. So if you encounter an issue, we are there uh, to help you. Um, yeah, that's it. So, Jefferson. All right. Um, so I'm going to actually, so this, if you look at the, at the program, that's one of those blue squares, blue sections which uh, are meant for, for, the for the participants to work on their own, um, come, to us, come to us whenever they need. Uh, on this, this time though, I, I still feel guilty that I didn't finish showing the example. So we can probably go through the last example and then we can use that. And it's actually convenient because it's gonna bring back to our minds <coughs> um, what you had seen and and uh, and make clear the oh well just bring it back to this mode of trying to do the the exercise all right so the exercise that i proposed so the next one would be the projective i was actually right now running it uh, again trying to obtain a bit nicer results mm, without success that does not matter nice in which sense just trying to figure out some parameter values some different number of things and things like that to produce a, a nice plot. Someone has a question. 
Is it in the chat? No. So who is Xiao? If you want to unmute yourself and make a question, you're welcome to do so. Do you know, Faka, what the question was, or just that there was a question? I was I was just looking at the chat, and in the chat, Hui Xiao was asking the question: How can one know how many bins has been have been generated, and how many samples are there in one bin? Yes, but that's been forty minutes ago. It was during my presentation, and then I answered during the presentation. I will shut up. <laughs> no, come on. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for calling attention to that. Um, all right, so. So going back, oh, I'm not sharing my screen, sorry. <laughs> Let me share my screen so that you can see what I'm talking about. I'm talking about uh, one, one another notebook, which is the projective, using the projective algorithm. So here it is. We, we, we can see, I mean, the, the steps are all the same. That's the idea. Repetition brings familiarity and that makes us believe we understand the stuff. So once again, I I want to, I want from pi alf simulation, and then I define an array that's a detail in this case. But anyway, this has been done, so I, I should explain what's uh, in the screen. And uh, the important part is here. So I'm saying that okay, I'm going to create an instance of the simulation with those parameter values here. Lots of those parameters did not have to be here because they coincide with the def default values. But uh, it doesn't hurt to have them here. The idea is to, to show what they are. And the most important uh, two parameters here are, OK, first, we are using the ladder, the ladder, the one leg ladder, which is different from the square. I had said that it was similar to the square, but of course, the, 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 the conditions around the one is uh, periodic, one in one direction is periodic, and the other it isn't. So it's not really the same as using a square of four one. Sorry for that. Um, and the important parameters we're talking about are first, projector equals true. Um, that's what makes this example being called, uh, this notebook being called projective algorithm. And that we're varying uh, theta, of course. <clears throat> and after defining the the instance of the simulation, or in this case, the vector with three instances, we compile. Again, let's compile just one of them. And then we loop over uh, those simulations and run each one of them. All right? We have some definitions in the loops here just to restore our, our value of, for example, here that we are defining there in the simulation. And we are preparing this energy here to store the output that we're going to generate in the same loop using the analysis with the energies. Okay, so we have this output, and then I read the energies to this vector. And then we're able to, for instance, plot them. Here they are. And plot in the sense of output them, write them out. And we can also make a figure, we can make a plot like this one here. We expect a value minus 2.1, which is completely in agreement with the plot. But the error bars are just too big for, yeah, it's, they're just a bit, a bit too big, which is not so surprising considering that the values are actually pretty close to, uh, together. So if you look at the, the range of the y uh, axis, you see that we are varying very little. So that's what I was trying to improve a bit. But why is beta still um, used? How to choose a proper beta? Ha. How to choose a proper battle. I think Faka can answer that much better than I. Faka, are you there? So what is the question? The question, how to the use question, it? Yeah, the question is, since we use the projective uh, model, um, mode um, algorithm, and then what matters is the theta, why are you using that and how to choose the best data? Well, it's, it's a good question. I guess the, let's assume that um, psi t, you choose a, you choose a trial wave function. And the trial wave function, let's say, has an overlap with the with an excited with the first excited state, which is non-zero, and that defines an energy gap, if you want, between the ground state and this first excited state. So, for example, if I have a singlet trial wave function, and the first excitations are triplets, then the the the, uh, the trial wave function will be orthogonal to the triplet excitation. So, I have to look at the first singlet excitation. Okay, 
that's the that's the first part of the answer to the question. And then the theta has to be so one over theta has to be much smaller. So the temperature, the effective projection temperature, has to be smaller than this first excitation. And then you are guaranteed to converge to the ground state. Is that a is that a good answer or not? Do you, is that should I should I be more precise? Um, I think it's I think it's fine. Thanks a lot, Farka. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. It's very clear. <laughs> All right. Uh, the exercise for this for this notebook um, would be to to consider not a one leg but actually a three leg ladder. So it means change on L2 from one uh, to three, and then you have a, a classic result, a classic paper, um, which shows how actually. I mean, this is just an example, which shows how actually the, the spin correlations change according to the number of legs of the ladder. And they, what at the time was very surprising behavior, they show what's uh, a very surprising behavior in that it depends on being odd or even. Um, of course, the explanation is already given in the paper. And the difference, so it is not to be about, the exercise is not about reproducing the paper because the paper produced the um, use, mo use most of the numerical results for the Heisenberg, Heisenberg model. And um, the question here would be, so how does that play for the Hubert model? That would be then. That is then the exercise for this. And the exercise for the others, um, for the others notebooks, you find in the notebooks themselves, which are all copied into the tutorial. All right, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, I'm not going to say bye truly, but I'm going to just Stay, uh, stay here waiting for any questions. And we have the breakout rooms and have other people here. So we should, um, we should be able to help quite so many people at the same time. So if you do start working on the examples now, we have about one and a half hour uh, that are gonna be here for sure, as I said, after this time. And those times that are not marked in the, in the program, we might still be, might still be available, um, but it's not, there's just not, no guarantee. Probably someone is going to be and is going to respond even after perhaps some time. But we we say that for this next one and a half hour today, for instance, is the our own call time, and we are here uh, waiting for your questions. All right. So thank you very much, and we'll talk to you hopefully now or at least tomorrow. Oh, sorry, one very Thank stupid question. Are. Sorry. Um, uh, okay, no problem. Um, we wanted to stop the recording, uh, so everything after now will not be recorded somewhere. And yeah, of course, you're free to ask a question.